Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Communication 24-7 podcast, where we communicate about how we communicate. And I'm your host, Jennifer Furlong. You know, we're having another live episode, live streaming on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube. So anyone who's watching, I would invite you to please get involved, get into the comments, let us know what you're thinking, ask any questions that you would like to ask, and we'll our, we'll do our best to provide you with an answer. And if we don't know the answer, we'll figure it out one way or the other. Um, one thing I love about doing these live streams is I get to bring on guests who are so incredibly interesting. And not only are they experts within their field, but I just, you know, uh, Tyler, as we were just talking before the show started, he's like an onion. We peel back those layers and there's just all kinds of cool stuff. So for those of you um, who don't know, Tyler Foley, uh, the reason I wanted him on our podcast is he uh, is a specialist in public speaking and he has all kinds of great experience as an author, as a speaker, as a trainer, um, beginning with you know, as a six-year-old and getting into movies and television. So, so much I want to be able to to pull back on, on these layers and learn more about you, Tyler. But thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's my joy and pleasure to be here, Jen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the exploration for you to get to know me better, for me to get to know you better, for your audience <laughs> to get to know us better. Uh, you know, communicate 24-7. That's what we do, right? That is, you cannot not communicate, even when you think you're just uh, sitting there all silent. No, your your messages can be loud and clear. Absolutely. Um, so before we get into everything that you're doing now, and you know, again with the audience, I asked Tyler to be on the show because I really think he would be a great addition to help share his knowledge in public speaking and you know learning about how to become more confident in telling your stories. But before we get to that, I want to rewind the clock just a little bit to six-year-old Tyler and tell me a little bit about how, you know, I think that's probably the beginning of you being able to build uh, this lifelong career that you've been able to develop, you know, in, in public speaking and and so tell us a little bit about that little six-year-old Tyler and how did all of that begin? What happened there? Well, it was definitely a catalyst for me getting uh, the opportunity to be on stage at six um, really cemented what was a burgeoning love of performance anyway. If you ask my mom, I was, I was uh, you know, a performer from conception. I She claims <laughs> I tap danced in the womb. So I, I could see that being the case. Um, I, I've always fidgeted like my whole life, I'm a drummer too. So like, mm -hmm. if I'm just, if I'm having to sit, it's really hard for me when I'm doing the podcast, because we've got the mic right here, you know, right. And for me to not like tap out a rhythm, or if I'm just kind of waiting for stuff to happen, the intro, right, the the lovely intro that StreamYard puts on, do, 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 yeah. do, do, do. <laughs> like, I going? want, I just, I want it. Oh, yeah, it's got <laughs> such a funk and a groove to it that I just want to like, Bob yeah, with it. So yeah. I, I've, I've always been kind of rhythmic that way. I've always wanted to move. Um, when I was young, I was always the kid when family would be over for, um, you know, any kind of the family event, Easter, Christmas, birthdays, that kind of thing. I was always like, Whoa, do you want to see the thing? I remember getting a magic, <laughs> um, kit, you know, those little box kits of magic when I was like three or four and and doing like real simplistic magic where you'd make the egg levitate or I had a, a magic wand that I could dance with. I, I remember um, I did it so much that my aunt actually made me a magic cape. It was awesome. It was it was black velvet on the inside. Oh, I and love it. <laughs> black on the out, but it was neon hand prints. So it was this neon hand printed outside cape with this black on the inside so that I could do more magic. It had my magic pockets and everything. It was awesome. I had a top hat for it. Like my sister was my magical assistant. So <laughs> when I got a chance to be um, on stage at six, it was kind of already in the cards, but it was that, mm -hmm. that kind of catalyst moment that that really cemented this is a thing that you're going to do for a very, very long time. And I've, uh, I've, I have never looked back. 
Yeah, that that's wonderful. There are a couple of things. I love the fact that you're a drummer. My dad was a drummer. So I, I, I grew up understanding that whole need to just kind of he was constantly with the drumsticks beating on everything. And I remember when I was really young, um, we had this old station wagon, you know, the old school station wagons with like, you know, wood paneling and all of that yeah. on it. And I remember the very front of the station wagon, um, it was just beat to hell because he was constantly <laughs> practicing on it. And, and just, it was just all beat up. Um, and you one know, of the reasons I, I, I have my yeah. truck is because it has this leather steering wheel. It's leather. It's a wood wrapped a leather steering wheel, wood wrapped, and uh, the dashboard is leather too. And the way that the console is laid out, I have a, a, a really wide um, leather topped side console. So mm -hmm. I, I literally, ha I can do a full drum roll through and the, the side is the perfect size for the hi-hat and I do <laughs> drum in the truck. So if <laughs> I'm stuck amazing. at a uh, you know red light or whatever, or stuck in traffic, I have my drumsticks right there and I will pull them out and I will tap along. And then the bottom become the bottom of the steering wheel becomes the hot, uh, the um, not the hi-hat, the snare drum. The side of the window is my hi hat, and then the top of the steering wheel is the top tom. I don't, unfortunately, this is just a four piece kit in my truck because I don't have a, I don't have a <laughs> mid tom. Piece, but then, right? <laughs> but then I have the really nice floor tom, which is the side console, and I will, I'll do a, you know, I'll come up. That's amazing. Impromptu jam sesh in the middle oh, of of yeah, <laughs> in yeah. the middle of traffic. Traffic in the stop. middle of traffic. Yeah, yeah. And you're uh you're located in LA, right? No, 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 no. I did I was um for a time commuting back and forth when I was okay. really, really um committed to acting. No, mm -hmm. I uh I'm doing my best today to hide the, my uh my Canadian accent, but no, I'm way <laughs> up north in uh in oh, Calgary, okay. Alberta currently. Um was in Vancouver, like I said, for a long while and mm -hmm. commute back down to LA. Um on a semi-regular basis, I usually during pilot season, we'd fly down and I'd kind of like okay. get a, a crash pad down there. It, it's weird when you're an actor, the things that you'll do, there would be a group of us, usually about four or five who were starting to do enough day player stuff that going down for pilot season made sense, but it was never, a, it never is a guarantee anyways, but it was always going right. to be an off shot because not only as a Canadian, did you then have to like be good enough to get the role, but then you mm -hmm. had to be so much better than the next person in line for the producers to want to jump through the hoops to get you your visa that mm. um, it was always like a, well, we'll go down. We'll see. But because you're down for like three or four months for pilot season and you're actors and unlike everyone else in L.A., you can't work as a waiter or whatever <laughs> and whatever barista coffee shop um, you had to let we had to like have all of the money built up and then we just went down mm. and, and lived in L.A. So we would get like five or six of us and then we would rent like a two bedroom apartment and get Ikea bunk beds. <laughs> There you go. Hey, so like two people in the room, <laughs> and then like two on the couch in the living room, and the the only furnishing beyond the the pull out couch was like a TV and a PlayStation. <laughs> so. Yeah, but the cool thing about being in a group like that, I guess, is you you already have a, a ready made audience, so you could practice with each other, right? If you had lines and we, you know. well, that's the thing. You always had somebody to rehearse with. You always had people mm -hmm. to workshop with. You always had. I I I was. The, I would say the, I was the most successful in that time period because not due to talent that I had, but because of the social group that I hung out with that was so yeah. supportive. That was always on. It was very, I think that was the other thing too, is um, we were very diverse. So there was, we were never going out for the same role. And even if we did go for the same role, right. you kind of wanted one, if, if it wasn't going to be me, I wanted it to be him because mm -hmm. we don't want it to be one of these guys. You know, yeah. and it, um, it, it made for a really, just a really fun time period in my life. Yeah, I bet. I, you know, I hear there's a, a common theme and, and I, I love this aspect of your journey, you know, talking about your family and when you were young and just constantly moving and just even in the womb, just constantly yeah. tapping yeah. around. And, but it yeah. sounds like your family was very supportive of the fact that you had this need 
to perform. You had this need to get up, move around, do whatever it is that you wanted to do and, you know, entertain the family. And it sounds like you were able to have a friend group as well that yeah. supported that aspect of you. So, so important. Well, and I think, uh, you know, it's it's a lesson that I've, I've uh, you know, learned multiple times and, and continued on. Um, the importance of having a community that has your back and 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 giving mm -hmm. back to that community so that they have your back like you can't can't always mm -hmm. be a me 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 thing like being of right. service to your community uh and when you know when you have the ability to be charitable to be charitable to be supportive mm -hmm. so that when you are in need it's it's a lot it's a lot easier to a ask for help and a lot more people are willing to volunteer help if you've been of service to your community up front. And I remember uh, when I was 17, I had a, a medical incident that left the left side of my body paralyzed for almost a year. And mm. it's right, you know, it was right when I was a senior in high school. Um, I was, you know, in the my I went to a fine arts high school and I was cast in the main stage production. And that's actually a requirement of me to have graduated from the school was to perform in said mm. production. And uh, January 1st, 1997, uh, New Year's Day, I woke up and the left side of my body didn't work. And I unfortunately had to withdraw from the show. Um, I It cost me my graduation from my high school. Wow. I, I wasn't able to graduate from it. I got my high school uh, mm -hmm. diploma. I got my GED. Mm -hmm. Um, because I had more than enough credits to do it. But that that right. one thing to be able to say that I actually graduated from the Alberta High School of Fine Arts as opposed to attended the Alberta High School of Fine Arts uh, was unfortunately uh, taken away. But I, I because it was such a community, um, mm -hmm. you know, my friends really rallied around me. I really I had some unbelievable support. Um, and, and then I had the support of the community as well. Like my my doctors were um, basically family to me and, and surrogate mm -hmm. fathers. I, I know Bob Corbett uh, did a wonderful job of looking out for me, not only physically, but mentally. And um, I, I just, I, I was really, really blessed to have the community that I did. And like, I'm still friends with yeah. most of the people that I went to high school with. We may not communicate all the time, uh, right. but I, I talk to at least two people from high school in any given week. Mm -hmm. And they're not always the same people. And there's probably, uh, I could count at least 20 to 25 people that I'm in regular communication with. And we are geographically diverse. Like I have friends that I still talk to to this day that live in Dubai. I have friends, I have multiple friends in Thailand. A whole bunch of people went to Thailand mm -hmm. for some reason. Uh, <laughs> another few in uh, Singapore. I have friends scattered across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I'm, I'm in again, regular communication with them. I have one of my friends who graduated is a librarian in South Africa. Wow. Wow. And, you know, yeah, they crazy. scattered to the winds, didn't they? Yeah, she's super <laughs> cool too. Like she was, uh, you know, a, a really good girlfriend when I was, when I was in high school and, and I love kind of watching her journey. So, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. You know, what an incredible, um, journey that you had to face with waking up one day and the entire left side of your body, you know, is paralyzed. And I think that's a testament to the strength of relationships, because when someone goes through something like that, I, in 2016, um, I woke up and I had Bell's palsy all of a sudden, and the entire left side of my face just stopped working, you know, and it, it, and here I am, public speaking teacher, right, at a local university and trying to do my keynotes, right, trying to do, this is how I'm, this is how I operate, right, this is what I do. And to not have that be able to function like it's supposed to, I remember going into class and um, I was standing in front of the class and we were going over their midterm exam and I was struggling so hard just to even form a sentence. And yeah. thank goodness, one of my students just stood up. He's like, Professor Furlong, sit down. You are struggling. I got this. And so he just took my notes and went over the exam with everybody. And, the, and just got the an A of, for it, right? That's right. That I was, was like, bonus. wow, yeah, <laughs> bonus, yeah, point, mad points. But yeah. you know, it, it's helpful to have those types of people around you who, you know, not only are they compassionate, but 
they're compassionate in the way that they can also have a sense of humor about it. You know, I, yeah. my husband, he kept me laughing the whole time, you know, even though I had a hard time it's laughing. The meanest thing you would laugh they about do that. Me. My friends did that too. You laugh and you go, huh. and you're right. like, oh, you do it. it feels awful. I was trying to sip some coffee one morning and you know, I had the straw and then he showed me an episode of Family Guy when Peter had eaten one too many cheeseburgers and he had a stroke and like yeah. the whole inside of his body was like melted off and I spewed coffee because I couldn't control anything. Yeah. So I spewed coffee everywhere. And, uh, but it was funny, you know, that just kind of keep you going, let you know that, Hey, no matter what you're, you're yeah. still you and we still love you. And, you know, we got your back. Well, and it, it you know, it's funny that you're talking about the, you know, the, the drooping of the mouth because yeah, I remember having to eat th like you couldn't eat anything solid. So you had to eat the liquid, but you had to liquid like this and go in. I remember the moment that I realized something was wrong was not actually um, when I woke up, it was, and I not even getting up the stairs, getting up the stairs was weird, but I just figured I'd, I'd slept weird on, on my, you know, right. on <laughs> my side and everything was just kind of numb. This will go so, away. <laughs> Because I, to this day, I still do that a lot more on my uh, right side than my left side, but I'll fall asleep. And particularly if I've played hockey um, mm. the night mm -hmm. before, uh, I will, I will fall asleep and my arm will go numb, just, you know, oh yeah, exercise yeah. or whatever. And, uh, and so I, I, that was, I got up the stairs, just assumed that, you know, things weren't working because it was New Year's Day and I was tired <laughs> and I'd slept on something weird and whatever. Right. It wasn't until I was brushing my teeth that I was like, I think something's weird here because I couldn't keep the toothpaste in my mouth. It was just like, same, just oh like pouring up. Exact and I was same. like, why can't I brush my teeth? What is wrong with me? Is why am I right? drooling? And my mom came in. She's like, are you drunk? I'm like, no. She's like, are no. you hung over? I'm like, mom, I didn't drink last night. I was the DD. <laughs> she's like, are you sure? And I looked at her and then that's when she realized that something was wrong. I'm like, I promise you, mom, I didn't drink. I know, right? <laughs> It's like, whoa, right. what is going on with you? So. Yeah. Oh, that's what this exact same thing happened to me. I was brushing my teeth. I went to spit and I couldn't control anything. I looked in the mirror and I could visibly as it was happening. And it was the scary. I didn't know if I was having a stroke or what. So, yeah. you know, at the time, it's a really scary thing. And, and um, you know, so I the thing about stories like that though and i think this is a good time to kind of transition into you know what what you talk about in you know some of your trainings i think is stories like that mm -hmm. you know something that we're able to use to connect you know to others um you know some might be hesitant to share a story like that because in some way they feel it you know maybe it makes them less than or mm -hmm. you know it'll make people look at you a certain way and now you know i could get really uh self-conscious and think okay when this starts twitching is everybody noticing <laughs> you know like something is twitching over here yeah but I, but sharing that story really just offers an avenue through which we can connect with with someone else on a you know on a basic human level we we have that need to be able to share you know these experiences so can you tell me a little bit about you know that's what you're doing these days right you're you're a speaker you're you're an author i do want to talk a little bit about your book because i love the title the power to speak naked so <laughs> i think that's the best title ever um but just kind of take us you know where you are now what you're doing on the speaking circuit and, and what are some of the things that you're doing you know i, I know you're a trainer so what is that specialty area of yours what are you training others in yeah well let's unpack a few questions that came yes. out of that mm -hmm. uh first of all you're right it's the power of story that connects us and so mm -hmm. when i am doing uh, pretty much any one of my training sessions whether it's a free session in our facebook group endless stages or if it's a one-on-one -on -one client that i'm working with or if it is uh, in any one of our power of influence or power to speak naked workshops or seminars, um, at some point, at very early on in any one of those scenarios, I'm talking about the power of story and helping people mm -hmm. find their story for the reason that you just mentioned. It's how we connect together. Mm -hmm. And one of the key pillars of my 
uh, training uh, and my core beliefs are that the thing you're afraid to say is what your audience needs to hear. Mm, um, because, you know, it's, as soon as mm -hmm. I said, you know, I was paralyzed and this and I was terrified, you knew exactly what I was talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And it's, yeah. it's interesting that you had a Bell's palsy because they're not sure what I had. That's why I call it a medical incident. Bell's palsy mm -hmm. would have been the most likely scenario. And it was what they were first diagnosing me with, except for I should have had feeling in the rest of my body, which I didn't, uh, oh, stroke was yeah. ruled out because I shouldn't have been able to get better from it. Right. So what did I have? Oh, Who something knows? in between that. <laughs> but interestingly enough, I had it and my, um, you know, and I had to go through it. My mom was there with me it, almost a year of rehab before I could get everything working again, at least functionally to a point where I did it. And same thing when mm -hmm. I get tired, I know exactly what you're talking about, Jen. I get tired mm -hmm. or I get stressed mm -hmm. or I particularly dehydrated. And mm -hmm. I start to get the, the, yeah. the twitch under here or I can, I can yep. start to get, I, I, I smile it. lazy mm -hmm. now and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, and, or, and then I get really paranoid. I'm like, okay, time to get to a chiropractor because we got to get things adjusted. Right. I don't want to <laughs> um, so I, I'm very aware of it. Interestingly enough, five years ago, my mom actually did have Bell's palsy. Oh, woke up hmm. and her face wasn't working. And who was the first person she phoned? me and I, so i was my mom was there for me in comfort uh, nearly 25 yeah. years ago i got to mm -hmm. return the favor five years ago and then my niece three years ago woke up with a bell's palsy so, That's so weird. I, mine very likely now that we have a family history was closer mm -hmm. to a bell's palsy but it was a full mm -hmm. it, what bell's palsy would just be again the face so it was a full body yeah. palsy of some sort nice thing is is you can recover from it and so i was able to be there for my niece and say hey i've gone through this why because of the power of story i was yeah. in, and particularly for her because she was in junior high and and a girl and um you know she's she's social but she's not necessarily popular like she uh, mm -hmm. she she wrestles for one right mm -hmm. and um has won provincials twice uh, for her wrestling. And so, you know, she's a little bit of an outsider. And so, and especially at that age, you know, 14, 15 year old girl, uh, it's and tough, it, tough anyway, yeah, she, was, she was 13. Like these are the things mm -hmm. that you don't need when you're a 13 year old right. and just to add on to it. So I was able to say, listen, I was there. Mm -hmm. And then I was that resource for her. And then, and then Nana, it happened to Nana too. So she had two people who could directly relate to what was going on. And it's that power of story. It's that power of connection. I could have just said, hey, kid, it happened to me and, you know, you'll be fine. Or I could say, right. listen, I woke up and I didn't know how to brush my teeth. And then she, you said it, I said it. She understood exactly what I was saying. Anybody who's yep. had that happen to them now knows exactly what we're talking about because it's those details. It's the mm -hmm. specifics. The more specific you can make your story, the more universal it talks to people. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, that, that power of storytelling becomes the, the key thing. As for the book, do I talk about <laughs> it in that book? No, it's actually not in the book of all the things that I talk about in the book that, that, that storytelling method actually isn't in it. Um, so we're uh -huh. putting together a revised edition that'll come out next year because it's one of the oh, things that I yeah. love to put in the most. And most of this book is, um, it's that initial introduction into getting over the fear Mm -hmm. of um of speaking uh getting over that fear more specifically the fear of judgment most of the right. most people will claim to say that they're afraid of public speaking and you and i both know jen that is not yeah. true we are right. not afraid right. of public speaking or we would never be able to order food in a restaurant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the reality is we're afraid of judgment and i can help you deal with the fear of public judgment i can't help you if you actually have a fear of public speaking because you'll never go out in public and open your mouth Right, right. And this is an excellent example. You know, Larry, she, he, he, uh, just, he posted on, he's watching on Facebook, the little, you know, sad, sad emoji listening to our stories. But, but Larry, at the end of the day, it's really not a, yeah, it was a sad experience. But the important thing is, as we're sharing these stories, and we're able to connect with with one another and, and serve as an example to others who might be going through something similar, you know, it's a way to kind of share that that hope and that sense of peace and that sense of, hey, you know what, this this is, you know, 
temporary right here, what you're feeling right now, you know, it can, and it will get better, you know, and have that sense of sense of hope is so incredibly important. I'm so yeah. glad to, to hear that you're going to revise and, and add some more of, of that into the book. Cause I think yeah, it's so gonna, important for people to hear. expand it from 134 pages to probably like the 150, 180 range, yeah. like tack on at least another two chapters into it, if not three, just to, you know, especially the more that I've been doing the training, the more I have been speaking, the, the bigger the stages that I've got on, the more I have learned. Um, you know, I've, I've been speaking from stage now for 36 mm -hmm. years, but I'm always learning and I'm always working yeah. with, you know, it's it's fun. The, the names that I get to work with now, the, the people yeah. in the room that I get to be with and um, and it's fun. And it's it, to to the sad face. It was it was it was terrifying for me. And when <laughs> yeah. I, I was a 17 year old boy and grow who grew up in the theater. So I had actually painted my room to be like a, a black box. Okay. Because theater okay. Spaces yeah. are like super comfortable for. So when I woke up, I was literally in a black box and it was over Christmas mm -hmm. break. So I was totally isolated from my friends. And because my left leg didn't yeah. work, I drove a 1984 Honda Accord that was a five speed standard. So I couldn't of course even clutch it was. to yeah. go <laughs> visit my friends. It was just, it was, it was awful. But um, just, um, just prior to that, well, I guess it wasn't just prior to that because it was 97. I think the song came out in like 1991. But one of my favorite uh, singers of all time is Gloria Estefan. And oh, she yes. has that song coming out of the dark. And I would like mm -hmm. play that because that was, I was like, me up, up <laughs> right. And I would just like do this because I would, I would leave and it was so um, metaphorical, you know, walking out right. of my black space <laughs> into the light of day. And, uh, you know, nothing was going to hold me back. And it was great. It, it actually, um, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because it gave me the drive to get back on stage because I was getting really yes. complacent. Like when I was 17, you know, I, at that point I had been acting for 11 years and, you know, I was, I was, I was at the fine arts high school and I was one of the, I was a lead <laughs> in the play when I was in grade 10 and most grade 10s don't even get to be right. in the play the wallflowers, <laughs> but I was Sean Tyler Foley and I could do this. And then I got to play Enoch Snow the next year. So obviously I was somebody of importance. Obviously. <laughs> and, and that when, when all of a sudden you're, the whole thing was stripped away. I, it was really humbling, but it also mm. gave me a fire. I was like, cause everybody told me I'd never act again. I'm like, mm. watch yeah. me. Yes. And, um, and it, it really reignited my passion for it. It also, um, made me hyper aware of when I do get complacent and if I mm. need to step back, because mm -hmm. the same thing happened when I was 25, I was like, I've gone through the shows. I don't even want to act anymore. It had become a job. And so I literally retired from the business for almost 15 years where I just, yeah. I, I, I walked you away. You lost the passion like, for it. Yeah. It just, it yeah. wasn't fun, but again, got mm -hmm. me onto the path to do this yeah. because performance, I'm never not going to be a performer. I just may not mm -hmm. be acting in film and television for a bit. Yeah. You know, there's something that you, that you said that uh, it's one of the things that I try to emphasize to my students when we're in the classroom and we're, we're talking about public speaking and getting into that mindset of public speaking, because it's so easy to talk yourself out of things. Mm -hmm. But just even that act of you, you know, bursting out you know, of the room and listening to that song and just even opening your arms, you immediately feel a transition. Mm -hmm. And you're you're literally tricking your mind at that point. You know, it's like, yeah. okay, I wasn't feeling it at first, but man, okay, you know what? Here I am, I'm doing it, you know, and I'm feeling it in my body. I'm opening it up and my body and my mind is beginning to feel that as well. So, you know, that, yeah. that mindset and the ability to just, you know, impact that mindset is, is so crucial. Um, well, and it's what funny do you because- say? Mm -hmm. Well, it's one of the, again, I, I have so many gifts from being a performer early on yeah. in my life that I did, that I'm just starting to understand now, like really yeah. in the last five years, I've become hyper aware of just, just how incredible mm -hmm. those blessings were. Um, and, but the main one is I've known for a very, very, very long time that I am in control of my emotions because yes. I've had to control my emotions to portray mm -hmm angry when I'm yes. actually happy, mm -hmm. happy when I'm actually sad or tired or exhausted or whatever, like you have to go on stage and that I understand that um, emotions are entirely driven by our own mental state. Mm -hmm. And, and then, and, and two, 
embracing the physicality of it. it you if you want to feel something your whole body has to do it and if you can embrace that with your body uh you can do it you and i were talking off uh mm -hmm. line you know i friday i had a keynote presentation <laughs> Yep. I was sick as a dog. <laughs> like I could not, I could not mm -hmm. function, but I also knew that I could pull it together for an hour. Yes. Right? Like yes. I, I did everything. It's a moment in time. Yeah. I knew, mm -hmm. I knew that if I, you know, timed the cold and flu medication just right. <laughs> and if I drank enough orange juice and water, you know, and I was staying my, hotel was just across the street from the venue you know i can get there i'll i'll be lazy and i'll get a taxi to take me even though it was literally right across the street thought of walking was exhausting stayed in the green room until they called my name and i i asked that they play my intro song this was not a crowd that actually would normally have an intro song but mm -hmm. i have trained my body to know that when I hear, yes. are you going to go my way by Lenny Kravitz? It's go time. Love it. Yes. You know? And yeah. so as soon as why, because I'm a drummer, right? Right. <laughs> and so I can't help it. I, I hear it in my head and my, my body wants to move. It's just right. it's trained to know that it's, it's go time when I hear that. And the, the promoter was kind of like, really? I, <laughs> I mean, I guess we could make that work. We've got the, okay. And so they did, they introduced me, I got the song and I, it was enough to get me going. And then once I got going, I forgot that I was yeah. sick. And I bet and the then, audience enjoyed it too. They audience they had no clue. It. Yeah. The audience had no clue. So when it, it, when it came off and everybody was coming around to, to chat with me, uh, afterwards, I was like, um, you're going to want to <laughs> stay way far away and your elbow bump. And they're like, you're sick. I'm like, Oh, I'm dying. I got to get back to the hotel yeah. room. They're like, we had no clue. I was like, that's good. And the worst is it was for a health and safety conference too, in a time of COVID, right. which really shouldn't be going in public spaces <laughs> no. sick. I was like, don't worry. Three tests, don't worry. including the rapid I'm one good. at the door. I'm, I'm good that way, but still don't do this. You know, Just mask. stay away from the splash zone and, and yeah, you'll be exactly. fine. Right. <laughs> so what, you know, what advice would you give someone who they're like, okay, Tyler, Jen, I've never had Bell's palsy. I've never experienced anything like that. Um, when I think about my my life and the stories, I can't think of anything that would be even remotely as interesting as talking about, you know, that that kind of thing that you went through. So yeah. what's up? <laughs> well, I, I, I first of all, I sympathize with you because mm -hmm. I one of the things that always makes me laugh as a as a professional um, you know, communicator and speaker. Um, and given the life that I have had, when people read my biography, I'm like, that guy is cool. I would yes. love to meet sounds, him. Like, sounds so good. <laughs> who, who's that guy, Jen? Like, did right? we yeah. met him? Do we know this guy? Like, he sounds awesome, you know? And I'm, I'm always fascinated when I hear my own bio because mm -hmm. I, to me, I, I lived my life. And yeah. I think a lot of people, until you can actually step outside of the mm -hmm. lens are like, mm -hmm. I, I'm just me, right? I'm just Tyler. You're just yeah. Jen. We just live our lives. Like what? No That's big right. look. Um, so one of the, again, one of the things that we do in our workshops is I show everybody that you have at least bare minimum five stories mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. And the first part of the exercise you and I can do right now so that mm -hmm. anybody who's listening is able to, to do this really quickly. And that mm -hmm. is, it, it involves some simple math. So I want you to take your age, however old you are right now, and I want you to round down or up to the nearest five. So round to your nearest five, whatever that oh, number Lord. happens to be. Right? <laughs> yeah, don't say it out loud. I'll do the math for me. You don't say it out loud because nobody wants to hear 30 year olds do math, right? Right. Well, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Gen um, X, that's all I'm gonna say. Gen yeah, X. Gen X. Yeah. So now we're gonna take X divided by five. So you round it to the nearest five so that this math becomes easy. You divide that number by five. So you mm -hmm. should just get some nice whole numbers. So if I'm to do this exercise, I'm 42. I'm going to near round down to the nearest five, which is 40. Right. And then I'm going to mm -hmm. divide that by five, which will give me eight. So we're mm -hmm. going to have intervals of eight. And if okay. there's some sticklers in there, they're like, yeah, but those last two years have been exciting and I want them back. 
Okay, you're fine. <laughs> Tack whatever right. you, you rounded you down. You can you can be flexible with yeah, this, right? Whatever you rounded down, <laughs> tack that onto your first time period because I promise you, you don't remember your first 12 to 18 months. I have memories right. from 11 months old, but they're like just kind of like auditory things. So like yeah, you know, yeah. like they're 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 blurry images. So I kind of right. think I remember stuff, but let's let's be honest, you don't actually have really good, clear, distinct memories. And we don't even have really good weeks. memories for last week. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah exactly. Right? <laughs> right. So if you if you want to do this and you, you're like a stickler for it, mm -hmm. if you have that remainder um, to extra numbers, tack them on at the beginning. And if you had to round up and you want to subtract numbers, subtract them from the last time period, because we can mm -hmm. I. We, it's hard to remember what last week was, but I have more recent memories than I do yes. long-term memories. So yes. it, whether you want to do that, the idea is we're going to divide your life into five even time periods. For me, those time mm. periods are eight years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question is, when I look back in my life for the first time period, zero to eight, mm -hmm. what's the first memory that pops to my head when I think of that time? Mm. And it, it, it's the first memory that comes to your head because that's going to be the most significant one. That's going to be the most important one to you. And it could be anything. It could be a smell. It could be a color. It could be a feeling. It could be a vivid image. It could be a something. For me, I have two that are immediately um, present in my mind that just pop like that. Uh, the first one is the first time mm. I was ever on stage. Right. Mm -hmm. the sound of applause that I got. And I know exactly where I was. And it, and it, so it starts the auditory because I, it's the, yes. the applause. And as soon as I hear the applause, now I can see everything. I can, I can, I know the stage that I was on. I can see the audience. I can, um, I can see because it was a Christmas pageant. I can see the wise men over here. I can see my best friend, Lisa over here playing Mary. I, if there was a little cradle in front of me, there was a, a small little doll and a whole bunch of presents stacked on baby Jesus's head because I didn't know where to put the presents that the wise men were giving me. So that's where they went. Mm, yeah. And all the, and the audience audience laughed every time I did it. And it, right. was, it was joyous for me. And I, I can, I can hear this, the laughter. I can hear the applause. I know what it looked like when they stood up. I know just that thunder sound when you get a standing ovation, everybody's like cheering and happy. Like I, that to me has been a very profound and it has influenced every decision that I've made, obviously with my life. Like that, right. it was that precursor. It's the thing that really set me on a trajectory. So that is a very mm. powerful memory for me that anchors me, that tells me and in, influenced and informed my decisions in my life. And then wow. the next mm -hmm. uh, po most powerful memory that I have, um, arguably the most powerful memory that I've ever had in my life happened it, almost to the day three months later. And that is the sound that my mother made when a police officer and my family physician came to her back door to tell her that my father would never be coming home. Mm. And mm. the, the sound that she made um, mm -hmm. was the most terrifying, wailing, uh, guttural noise that I've ever heard in my entire life. It, it was so animalistic, it was haunting, and I mm -hmm. never want to hear it again. And yeah. again, that has influenced a lot of the decisions that I've made in my life, right. like being hyper aware of how uh, precious life is, um, how mm -hmm. how much we need to enjoy it too. So uh, as as tragic as it was to lose a father at six years old, um, right. I also had some incredible grace in that event happening in that in losing one father, I ended up gaining at least 10 father figures in my life, very strong, very um, incredible men who gravitated into my life to fill that void. And in mm -hmm. fact, I would say uh, exceeded and overfilled that void because yeah. I got to have some great mentorship, some great tutelage from some incredible men throughout my life that I'm still in contact with. So, you know, and then, and then all the lessons that come with that and, and being, you know, um, uh, I always think of the line in princess bride, um, the Spaniard must've studied and in studying, he would have learned that man is mortal, which means he would have tried to put the poison as far away from me as possible. So, right. What a fantastic and scene. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> it was just absolutely yeah. beautiful. The battle of wits. And, and I think about that, you know, we, we, um, I do recognize that man is mortal. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to try and put dangers as far away from me as possible. But I also recognize that in order to truly live, we need to push ourselves beyond our comfort zones. So 
I look at something as, is it an actual threat or is it a perceived threat? And let's, let's analyze it that way, which mm. again is one of the first things I talk about in public speaking. Why mm. are you actually afraid to speak? Right. right. And a lot of it comes back to those early childhood memories yeah. where somebody has either grown up in a household where children are to be seen, not heard. Mm-hmm. And so they say, you know, the, and it becomes ingrained that if they speak, there is a negative consequence for it. They're going to get in trouble or worse. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the or worse that I really feel bad for, yeah. for those people because there, there should never be or worse if you speak up and use your voice. But that becomes conditional. That becomes training. And so now they've learned that there is either emotional and or physical pain that comes along with it's associated using their with voice. It. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to do it. The other one is mm -hmm. usually a memory of um, some being called upon in school, right? Usually mm -hmm. early on in an elementary setting where you weren't prepared, you didn't know the answer and the teacher called on you, uh, usually to get your attention, which is just a cruel trick. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then you were unprepared and everybody laughed or you said the right. wrong answer and everybody laughed. And then you learned again, that there is a negative association with using your voice and speaking up in public. And those, those memories can be very formative. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I love to do this exercise. You break your, your life into the five time periods and what are the most significant memories? And mm -hmm. so you should have at least five stories because it's real easy because you're always going to have significant memories. So for me, I have, you know, this really joyous one of, of hearing applause that has really informed my life. I also have this really tragic one of hearing my mom wailing uh, when my father passed mm -hmm. away. Um, fast forward uh, to the next time period, I remember the the conflict of joy and sadness the first time I actually grieved my father's passing. It was at my um, sixth grade commencement and I won the award for the student of the mm. year. I was the top student in my school. And I remember beaming with pride yes. and walking past my mom and there was this empty chair right beside her. Yeah. And as I walked past it, I was like, like it's a full auditorium, right? It's the end of the year assembly, right. every parent, every teacher, every, everybody was there. And I remember thinking, why, why is that chair empty? And then thinking, oh, my father should be there. And then thinking my yeah. father will never be there. And then it was this cascade of emotion where I end, right. ended up crying, thinking my dad's never going to see me get this award. He's never going to see me graduate. He's never going to see yeah. me graduate from university. He's never going to see me get married. He's never going to meet his grandchildren. And I went through this oh, yeah. massive mm -hmm. you know, thought exercise right there on stage bawling. Right. Everybody thought I was crying because I was happy to get Your this Your emotions award. were already heightened anyway. Yeah. And I was happy to get the award. And that's the thing. It was this, yeah, this, this yeah. weird conflict where I was both incredibly prideful. And then the, the the beautiful thing of it, as I walked past, I was like, no, it's it's not empty. Like if the chair was actually empty, somebody would have been sitting there. My father was there and he was there to see me. And I, I've always used mm -hmm. that as a, as a source of comfort. So, you know, the the stories can have multiple lessons. And that, yes. that's where this exercise really gets powerful. The math part of it and coming up with those memories shouldn't take more than two to five minutes because I do want it to be the first memory that yeah. springs to your head, right? Yeah, and trigger. so for me, the two yeah. sounds at six, uh, the next one is um, at 12. And then the next one is waking up with my face not working. Um, but then the next one is the first role that I booked in Vancouver. Right. And the pride and the joy that came with that, um, the the I the decision when I decided to retire from acting, I know exactly where I was in the path that I was on um, the meeting my wife for the first time mm -hmm. and knowing that I was going to marry her and her thinking that I was this crazy dude for coming and talking to her in the middle of an airport. I swear to you, I, I, I know exactly where we were standing. I can recreate it every time we fly through Toronto. I'm like, hey. The, yeah. This is our gate. And she's like, okay, yeah. you know, I, we have to after, <laughs> okay, uh, cheese ball. <laughs> yeah. yeah. After my brother in law got married, he got um, married um, down in Jamaica and we were flying back and we had to, to go through uh, Pearson International. And I made her, I made her, I, I was like, we got to go to our gate. We got to get a picture, got to kiss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. I, I, I know exactly where we were. It's a joyful memory for me. My other, my most recent memory is the birth of my daughter. Like, I know. I know everything that happened in that yes. room, even though my wife was mad because I was sleeping through most of her labor uh, because they had this nice little uh, day bed for the dads. Uh, so I, she labored, I slept. And then, you know, when my daughter finally came out 23 and a bit yeah. hours later, I was like, oh, hey, good job, honey. And then I got to be the first to hold her. <laughs> uh, of course, of course, of course you more. did. <laughs> I, was, I was there at the beginning. I should be there at the end. And that's how it happened. And, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, so these, those are significant memories for me. And then where the mm -hmm. exercise comes in 
and where you know I can't help your audience with this right now, and they're going to have to go and do right. it, is yeah. ask yourself why is that memory so significant to you? Mm. And mm. it's that exploration mm. of the why, and then the exploration of what are the lessons that can be learned from these memories. Like, what's the Les Brown says it famously: yes. never make a point without a story, never tell a story without a point. So yes. if you're going to mm -hmm. tell these stories, what is the point of the story? Mm -hmm. And there can be multiple points and there can be multiple lessons. You can use stories in different ways. Yeah. But you need to know why you're telling that story and it should have a, a reason behind it. And in, in that exploration, that takes significantly longer. But I promise you, everybody listening to this has at least five stories. And it may seem simplistic to you. Mm -hmm. But you never know who needs to hear that message until you speak it out loud. And one of the right. biggest disservices you can do to the world is to not tell your stories. Yeah. You know, there's something that that Larry posted and and I want to read it. I'm going to I'm going to show it and read it because I, I think it it fits beautifully with something you said earlier. And and I don't want to miss this opportunity to to point out something that you said that I think is so important. Larry says both of your stories are positive and I wish I would have heard them years ago. Not that it. Not that it to either of you years ago, I had a really bad experience in Iraq where my face was peppered with glass and my lower face, neck and upper back has fresh tar from the road tucked under the skin. Mm -hmm. I was terrified to be out front for a long time. That's unlike me. Hearing others makes me feel as though we all go through things and how we deal with them show who we are, but who we will become. And then he mm -hmm. follows up with not that it needed to happen to either of you years ago. Um, and but not that it needed to happen to you either, Larry, but these exactly, things, what they exactly. happen and it's what we but, do with them that, that matters. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and by the way, Larry, thank you for your service. And, mm -hmm. um, and believe me, I understand. Um, I can't, I can't fully understand being in the line of combat, but I, I definitely <laughs> sympathize with the, with yeah, the Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's important. I'm so grateful that he, he posted that in the comments because, it relates back to something that you said earlier about the the story that you you need to tell or maybe you're most afraid to tell is mm -hmm. the one that others need likely most need to hear and you know i just thinking about my own stories like we're we choose the stories that we allow others to know about us right mm -hmm. and it's very rarely that i talk about you know as you were doing the exercise i was thinking about okay what stories you know would i share in that time frame and i have a very uh very strong recollection of you know as a, a very young child um there was a lot of uh violence in my home mm -hmm you know, and grew up with alcoholism and, and there was drug abuse and with the violence and a very strong memory that I have is my mom and her boyfriend at the time getting into a physical fight. And mm -hmm. she threw one of those really old school, heavy, like 1970s ashtrays. That's like, you know, mm -hmm. this big, mm -hmm. she threw it at him. He ducked and it hit me. And mm -hmm. I was only like, maybe, I don't know, five or six years old at the time, but it's, that moment of just feeling the terror, right? And the chaos that was around me. And then fast forwarding to the next decade, you know, that I'm thinking about and seeing how those formative years really impacted my decisions. Like when I graduated high school, I went into the Marine Corps because yeah. I needed that sense of empowerment. I wanted mm -hmm to be empowered. I wanted to feel strong and in control. And, you know, and now I can see that connection, but that's an example of, you know, Larry, that's a, a story that I don't tell very often that, you know, and I don't, I don't know why it's not like it reflects anything bad on me, but it is hard. You know, it, it's yeah. very difficult for people to uh, show that raw, that rawness, yeah. that, that side of them. Um, but I think it beautifully, you know, with what Larry says, it beautifully connects with what you said, Tyler, in that sometimes that one story that you're most hesitant to tell, maybe somebody else does need to hear that. Well, and it, I, I, I know this to be true. And if, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell another mm -hmm. story to illustrate my mm -hmm. point. Um, I had the privilege to speak at a, an amazing event called Life by Design. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, this would have been about five years ago now. 
And uh, not only did I have the privilege to speak at the event, but I had the privilege to speak with a couple of really good friends of mine who are also really, really phenomenal speakers. And the mm -hmm. keynote um, at the end of the event, I was the second last speaker to go. And then the, the keynote was a friend of mine, Jared. And Jared uh, is um, has made a very comfortable living for himself selling life insurance. And uh, his talk is called the 10 minute time machine hmm. and he talks about and i i can't do it justice in the time that we have this is a, a you know a 45 minute keynote that uh brings you you know heights of laughter he is so funny he's so good with a story he, you're laughing and then you're crying and then you're like deep crying sobbing and it connects with you on about a thousand different levels because he's so good at telling his story with the details mm -hmm. but his the 10 minute time machine is about the moment in time where he was finally successful in his decades long quest to find the correct combination of alcohol and pills that would allow him to leave this life and still leave his life insurance policy to his children, who he felt at the time would be better off with him not in their life than yeah. with him in their life because at that point his wife and him had not only separated but divorced he had lost complete mm -hmm. custody of his children his wife had sole custody of his children and he wasn't even allowed to have visitations with them that weren't supervised and this one time where he managed to fake sobriety long enough at a family function for his wife who needed a break uh, allowed the children to stay overnight at his house but because he had become so patterned in his quest that it was automatic for him that he would wait in the middle of the night, he would wake up, he would go get his Rice Krispie Square because it was the only thing that his stomach could tolerate that would allow the alcohol and the pills mm -hmm. to go in there and not make him sick, that he could then start trying these combinations of pills and alcohol and he got it right. Mm. got it right on the night that his kids were there and he couldn't quite figure out why his kids were there and he figured he was just hallucinating because obviously he's high as, you know, mm -hmm. and... Right. And then his son, right when he was just like the light was coming, he was the, he would, he knew that this was different. He knew that mm -hmm. this was working. His son came into his focus and he said, dad, are you okay? And then he panicked. He was like, I can't, it, all of a sudden he realized in that moment, the last shred of consciousness in him said, you can't, mm -hmm. it can't be today. This can't be the day. This right. can't be the day, not in front of your children, not in front of your children. Yes. And he managed to articulate enough uh, mumbling to have his son phone 911. His son phones 911. Jared actually was legally dead for a moment. They revived him. Um, wow. uh, the ambulance got there, revived him. They got him uh, to emergency. They pumped his stomach and, and he's been sober ever since. And the reason he calls it the 10 minute time machine is he goes, if I could go back in time and change anything, would I? Mm. And he said, no. Mm. He needed to literally hit rock bottom. He thought mm -hmm. he'd hit rock bottom, but he hadn't until all at what literally he could have lost everything in that moment. And he mm -hmm. needed that form of jarring wake up for him to really, truly commit to his sobriety, to develop a relationship. He has a relationship with his children. Now he wasn't going to have a relationship mm -hmm. with them. If he'd continued down that path for sure, if he was dead, he couldn't have a relationship. Yeah, and that lasting them. memory of, yeah, for them. Exactly. Oh. It's, you know, like all of the, all for all those reasons, he needed that moment to happen. Um, and now he's got a, a great life. Like he, you know, again, sells life insurance. So how hard is it for somebody who sells life insurance to talk about trying to, not only that they were an addict and struggle with sobriety, mm -hmm. uh, but that, that they were suicidal uh, and trying to end their life, but here buy this life insurance policy, right? It's yeah. a very difficult thing for him to articulate, but he tells this story at life by design in the audience was a woman by the name of Charlene and Charlene had been gifted the ticket to life by design uh, by a friend and out of politeness, she went just to go just mm -hmm. because she was going to go. Uh, but it didn't really matter if she went or not, because uh, the week before she had polished up and purchased a beautiful rifle, uh, had picked mm -hmm. out a beautiful spot in the middle of the mountains, overlooking the lake in the hometown where she lives. And uh, that was where she was going to end her life the following day after going to this mm -hmm. little seminary thing. And she heard Jared speak and his details, his specifics about where his mindset was, what his routines were like, everything that he put into the story. He was, he's very detailed in his story. Mm -hmm. um, 
right down to the Rice Krispie Square and why he has the Rice Krispie yeah, Square. Like yeah. we get details with it. And she said, you know, it spoke to me. I realized that I needed help. Yeah. So she reached out and on Monday, she put the rifle away. In fact, she um, gave it to a, uh, a friend and then said, this is what this was for. Do not give this back to me, no matter how much I ask. And I need to go get help. So she went and she got the help that she needed. She really worked on it. And the following year, she told her story mm. at the next Life by Design because it's an annual conference. She reached out to the uh, promoter. She said, I've never spoken before in my life. And she never had. Mm -hmm. um, she's like, but I, I feel that this is a story that I need to tell. Like, yeah. I like one thing can do it. And she, she, she just felt that she had to go and do this. And the promoter was like, absolutely, you can. Charlene tells her story. And there are three people in the audience who are at various stages of the same planning that she was in for very oh, wow. Mm -hmm. They came and reached her and they said, how did you get help? Because I think I need help too. Yeah. So Jared sharing his story in a very, very vulnerable and very brave way mm -hmm. allowed Charlene to have that moment. She, the, the rest yeah. of the audience was moved by what Jared mm -hmm. said, right? Cause he's an, a phenomenal speaker. But Charlene was his audience that day. Yes. She was who needed to hear the message. Everybody else was moved by it. She needed to hear it. Yes. She then got the help that she needed and three other people the next year needed to hear her. Jared has it saved at least four people because he was brave. Charlene has saved at least three people because she was brave. There is a ripple effect that happens when we tell our stories. Our stories are not for everybody. Mm-hmm. That's you right. That's but right. the more specific we are, the more universal they will resonate, the more people will will understand. I can affect and have uh, impact on people just by telling my story, but there's usually one person who needs to hear it. That's right. And, and, and I think will. Lorenda says that, you know, our stories connect to specific people depending on what they need, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a great example of that in that, you know, you may not reach everybody in that audience, but when you're in the moment and, and if y'all will notice when, when Tyler is sharing these stories, he's putting us in the moment, you know, and, and just with our, our sense of smell, our sense of touch or, you know, our, our emotions, you know, what we can see, what we can hear, you know, and that's such a powerful tool to be able to use to connect with others and, and place them in that story with you so that those emotions and what we're feeling can resonate you know, with others. I, I, I think that's, you have displayed that beautifully, you know, through, throughout this conversation and not only displaying how to do that, but also showing that, you know, with your particular stories and then listening to other stories, how it really does serve to, to connect us. And I think there's, you know, in, in the comments, you know, there's a lot of comments coming in from LinkedIn with stories that need to be you know, communicated and even Larry chimed back in. I, I get it. It's, it's soul stirring. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, even in grief work, telling the stories can bring healing. Yeah. And, the, and it's so true, right? Like you look at, you know, um, I, 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 I really, again, I had a whole, um, many, many father figures in my life. One mm -hmm. of, um, one of the most influential, in fact, the man who taught me to tie a tie, uh, mm -hmm. Warren Bailey. Uh, and who is uh, not only a father figure to me, but his son, Chris, and I are, are such good friends. We're basically brothers. Um, mm -hmm. It's, you, you know, brother from another mother. I, I, I see his mom as almost as much as I see my own mom. Um, but Warren was, was a true um, humanitarian. He was like, of all the men I could pattern myself after to be like, Warren mm -hmm. is probably it. He had an incredibly deep faith and he was one of the most... Uh, uh, just level men on the planet. He, you know, he was a, a, a referee for hockey. Um, and, and like, that can't be an easy job because right? it wasn't right. even like professional <laughs> refereeing. Like he was doing like men's league hockey, like, you know, right. it, it, that's not, that's thankless. And, you know, <laughs> and, and he ran a, a beautiful construction company. Like he just, uh, he, he was, he was an incredible, uh, human. And unfortunately we lost him, um, in the last year and a half. Mm. Uh, to dementia mm -hmm. and um it, way too young too like he was in mm -hmm. his 60s and that's that's too young mm -hmm. to lose anybody 
And uh, I remember being at his funeral and his children, and he has three, Chris being one of them, and, and then Kim and Geneva, um, sharing their stories of their father. Mm. And, you know, the funny stories, you know, they're crying, they're sobbing because they've just lost their father, mm. but they're, they're telling the stories of, of this beautiful human. And I, I remember thinking, like, that's, that's how life needs to be celebrated. And it's amazing how cathartic telling those stories can be because you remember the good times. And as you pointed out, the, the real key is, is to put somebody into your, mm. your viewpoint, to let them see the world through your eyes. They say, never judge a person until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Well, mm. I can't walk a mile in your shoes, Jen. I can't mm -hmm. walk a mile in a serviceman's shoes. I don't know what it was mm -hmm. like in Iraq. I don't. Mm -hmm. But you tell me the story, right? Yeah. You tell me what you saw, how you did it. I can I can walk that mile mm -hmm. with you. And now I can start to understand your viewpoint. I can have empathy. Right. I can have sympathy. That's where we gain understanding. And it's and it's through those specifics I need to I need to know what that world was like yeah. for you to experience. As you said, what did it look like? What did it smell like? What did it sound like? How did you mm -hmm. feel? What was what were the significant points to you? And when you share those, now I can understand. Yeah. And, and what an amazing first step, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is going to have to be round two where I'm going to have to have you back, Tyler, because now I'm wanting to talk about, you know, how this is just something that I think all of us needs, you know, in, in our society. I know it's probably no different up in Canada, you know, we're, we're, we're fractured, we're having a hard time connecting with others. And, and I think, I think you're right. Just being able to, you can't walk in their shoes, but if I can walk along with you, I might be able to at least reach an understanding to, you yeah. know, through your perspective. And that's so sorely needed, especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's going to have to be round two. Round two. That, right, round two. Um, Type I, in I the comments that. if you want to see Tyler yes. come back and talk to Jen. Uh, this has been an amazing hour with you. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I just enjoy not only listening to your stories, you know, and, and the things that you have to share, but you have such a wonderful way to connect with those who, who want to be able to get better at this craft, right? It is, it's a skill like any other skill. You just have to work at it. And sometimes if you learn different tools, just like what you've taught us today, you know, with, with trying to brainstorm on different aspects of your life and different stories that speak to you. That is such an invaluable gift that you have given the listeners right now. Um, and there's so many ways that they could use that to not only connect, you know, in here so that they can become more com comfortable and confident, you know, in telling their stories, but, but sharing it in a way that they know they're going to be able to connect, even if it's just one other person, they've done yeah. their job. They've done it. Um, so before we before we end everything, um, there's one last question I do always like to ask. Um, and before we get to all of your your links and all that, because I know that anyone who listens to well, if they watch this later or, you know, I will repackage it and put it out on the podcast if they want to get in touch with you. I'll make sure that all your contact is in the show notes. But um, tell me about a, a, a book that you would would recommend to to the listeners uh, beyond the power to speak naked. Cause this one's fantastic. That's um, right. <laughs> I, honestly, it, this, so this will sound weird. I, I will cl clarify. Do, are you concerned if it's fiction or nonfiction? No, nope. nope. Anything right. that you think is useful. Mm -hmm. um, I, if you want to see um, storytelling at its finest, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I'm going to tell you about a book that is a commitment. It's almost 600 pages long, semi-autobiographical. It's called The Fool's Progress by Edward Abbey. Mm -hmm. And it is um, a masterclass in dropped loops. So mm -hmm. uh, creating and introducing a theme or a thread that then gets picked up later on and continues to get picked up later on, but it is only hinted at throughout. It is an incredible um, masterclass in storytelling device of uh, present to past, present to past, and allowing the two timelines to converge. Um, and it is a, a beautiful revealing of how we are all human and all share traits, because at the beginning of the book, the, the main character, Henry Lightcap, you hate. There is nothing redeemable about that man. And you spend a good three quarters of the book going, 
why is this man even breathing air? Right. Why is he still here? <laughs> of space. And by the end of the book, you understand exactly why Henry is who he is, why he does what he mm. does. And you love that man. You yeah. love that man wholly and truly. And this is where exploring our stories are so important because you can't judge a person until you've walked a mile in their shoes. You need to know where they've come from. You need to understand that that everybody makes a decision for a reason. And if I could give mm -hmm. one, one book for anybody to read, not only is it thoroughly entertaining and not only is it long enough that if you're trying to you know, have a, a vacation book, this is a great vacation book, mm -hmm. uh, The Fool's Progress by Edward Abbey is hands down um uh, it's it's an american gem beautiful tale mm -hmm. uh it's it's one that more people should read and i recommend it to everybody and if you want a non-fiction one read the four agreements <laughs> but <laughs> fool's progress if you want a master class in storytelling that sounds that sounds amazing i'm gonna actually pick that up so i can so i can begin i haven't heard of that so thank you yeah. thank you for sharing that so how do we contact you tyler how do we contact you when we want to get in touch with you the uh, best way to do that, Jen, is through my website, seantylerfoley.com. Sean is spelled the proper Irish way, S-E-A-N-T-Y-L-E-R-F-O-L-E-Y.com. <laughs> so if you go to seantylerfoley.com, um, if you leave Jen, anybody who's left Jen comments, if you can like share and like and put this out and when the podcast comes out, if you could give it a five-star review, if you do that and you come to seantylerfoley.com, uh, I will, uh, right on the front page, we have um, a link to my free Facebook group called Endless Stages. And if you join up through the website, if you don't just cheat and go to Facebook, but if you come through the website, uh, we give you a whole bunch of bonuses, including a free PDF of the book. If they want it, uh, if they you know can't wait to get to a bookstore and they want it now, uh, go to endlessstages.com, uh, sign up for, or go to seantylerfoley.com, join up Endless Stages. We'll give you a free PDF of the book. Uh, I'll also give you access to my Drop the Mic Trainer series, which is an introduction introduction to public speaking. So anybody who, as you said, is it, they just they don't even feel comfortable with it and don't know where to begin. It's a great introduction to some of the ways to start to work on the mindset. And we also give a free twenty minute one on one get to know you session with me when you join through the website. So if anybody would like to learn more about me or have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, that's a fast way to do it. Go to seantylerfoley.com, click on endless stages, join the group, and we'll give you all the freebies, including a 20 minute conversation with me and we'll see where it goes. That is fantastic. And I'll make sure that all of that is in the show notes. Um, I'll also make sure to put it on our website when we have this, you know, we'll upload everything. Want to make sure that you can get directly into contact with, with Tyler because um, amazing human being just absolutely enjoyed this, this conversation. Um, and this will not be our last one. No, absolutely not. I will not let that happen because there's so much, so much more that, that we can talk about. Um, that, you know, I think you're just inspirational and, and truly wonderful. So thank you for being here today. No, thank you, Jenna. It's, it was my joy and my pleasure. All right, everybody, we will see you next time. Real quick, Monday, uh, it, all of you who are familiar with my side hustle as a media analyst, myself and other media analysts who work for the Media Bias Chart, we are going to have a panel discussion on Monday. It's going to be live on LinkedIn and Facebook as well as YouTube. And we're going to talk about, we're going to give you a peek behind the curtains of what it is that we do when we are reading and rating the news for reliability and bias. So it everybody has uh, everybody has an opinion on the news. So that should be a fun one to get involved with. So, all right. So we'll see you next time. Uh, thanks again, Tyler.